Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for CSIA. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative <laughs> webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, before we get started today, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view webinar PDF, click here. Uh, second, all participants are muted, uh, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left hand side of the webinar screen. You can chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tool at the top center of your screen. It is the icon that looks like a chat bubble next to the file folder. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A. For the benefit of those on the phone, I'll read the question out loud to the presenter. If you have a technical issue during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Check back on the CSI web, website. Once the webinar is posted, the go-to webinar button will take you to the YouTube link. And with that said, I'll hand it over to today's presenters. Sherilyn and John, you guys can take it away. Hey, good afternoon. Sorry, I lost my internet there for a moment. Hopefully it doesn't drop again, but if not, uh, John, I'm sure can cover it. Um, my name is um, Sherilyn Pasco, and um, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I really liked that um, snazzy video introduction. We need to get one of those for NIST. Um, um, I work um, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, where I serve <clears throat> as, a, um, as a policy advisor, um, kind of advising NIST on, on cybersecurity and artificial intelligence policy and strategy. And I also lead um, the NIST cybersecurity framework program um, and will be overseeing the cybersecurity framework through to um, our next update of CSF 2.0. Um, it's a it's great to to get a chance to talk again about you know some of NIST's work on on supply chain cybersecurity that we've published over the past year year and a half. Um, John. John Boyens, uh, Deputy Chief Computer Security Division. I've uh, been uh, managing our cybersecurity supply chain risk management program since uh, roughly 2009, and uh, work in a various other areas as they as they pop up. Uh, I'll start by apologizing. 
for my my brevity, my my son was kind enough to uh, hand off a very bad cold to me this morning. So um, if I'll probably go off video so you, I can uh, ignore my coughing uh, while <laughs> while Sherry speaks, and then uh, when I'm on, I I may be a little bit brief, but uh, happy to answer any questions. So thank you again for inviting us to speak. Uh, we. We love these events. It's kind of in this uh, kind of blood to get out there and engage with uh, the broader community. So thank you. And uh, thumbs up on that video, too. That was very professional. Thanks. Over to you, Sherry. Okay, I I think uh, Sherry's having <coughs> excuse me a <coughs> little problems with uh, the internet. We're we're quite the dynamic duo uh, here today, <laughs> so apologies. Uh, I'll go ahead and kick it off. Back in uh, May 2021, uh, there was an executive order 14028 on improving the nation's cybersecurity issue was issued. Uh, this was a massive, massive executive order, uh, largely in response to the SolarWinds incident and in recognition of a lot of the issues that we have with um, the, the software, software supply chain, the vulnerability management. Uh, Section 4 was largely uh, focused on, had, had a lot of NIST tests in there. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh in which we had to respond to different timelines and press pound. out a year. Uh, and that's that's kind of uh, the, the scope of our presentation here. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I guess I can try to get it. Uh, so some of those tasks that we had, uh, some of the early tasking focused on uh, what we should do here and now uh, kind of on the ground game. So it asked NIST to go out and identify uh, the the critical software, which is a little bit different uh, approach than what NIST is used to. We typically like to think of criticality in terms of context and the context to the mission business functions of an organization. So trying to Define criticality of software writ large um, without any context was a little bit challenging to us, I have to say, but it was a fun exercise. And ultimately, I think that we ended up on a uh, pretty good note in terms of we saw the benefit of how we did it. And it was somewhat of a staged approach on that the, the criticality uh, software piece. Um, and then uh, we also had a tasking for, which I'll go into a little bit more detail on uh, software verification was one of our, our first tasks. And we did that uh, with regard to uh, critical software. Uh, we also had a tasking uh, to identify um, <clears throat> security measures for that critical software, which we also did, and we'll, we'll probably touch upon in a little bit. Now that Sherry's back, I will hand this off to her. Um, Sherry, take it away if your internet is working. Yeah, so I dialed in, so if I, if I lose it again, I can at least still hear um, John coughing. Um, but um, <laughs> thanks, John, for covering, and apologies. I, I don't know what's going on with my Comcast. Um, but but as John mentioned, you know there was um, you know there's several c publications that we're covering today kind of split into three different categories. You know, first focusing on the security of critical software, focused on software that's already in use by federal agencies. You know, next we'll we'll talk a bit about 
you know, the security of software that will be procured by, by federal agencies and kind of discuss the best practices associated with, you know, secure software development. Um, and third, um, we'll focus on kind of John's work on cybersecurity supply chain risk management, which helps to kind of bring um, all these pieces together. Um, so as John mentioned, um, there was a, a really critical effort on, on focus on critical software. You know, one of the goals of, of the executive order was to kind of assist in developing this security baseline for critical software products that are used across federal agencies. Um, the measures that, you know, have um, been um, um, kind of um, identified by NIST are kind of existing best practices, but these measures have also been reinforced you know, by, um, by OMB, the Office of Management and Budget and the White House, which is now required um, federal agencies to kind of identify um, critical software as well as implement um, the measures that, that we've identified in our guidance. So, um, you know, as, as John mentioned, you know, the motivation for this um, identification of critical software um, was really focused on making sure that um, um, kind of operationalizing um, secure development practices um, with some sense of urgency. Um, and so there was kind of a, an, an effort that was needed to focus on software that's already in use in, in environments within federal agencies. And so um, under the executive order, um, NIST first defined what critical software is, um, and um, the definition kind of applies to software that's kind of purchased or deployed and used for operational purposes. Um, it applies only to software in use, so procurement was out of scope, um, and um, there's also a couple of other things out of scope, such as um, software solely used for for research or testing that's not deployed in, in kind of a production system. Um, so once um, the, the definition of, of EO critical software was published, NIST then kind of set out to define um, a series of security measures that focus on securing that software. So this is um, 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 on the PowerPoint, it's kind of an example of what um, those security measures look like. Um, and you'll see in the, in the far um, right-hand side, um, we've, we've kind of identified a number of existing resources um, published by NIST, published by other federal agencies and, and the private sector. Um, so these are all existing practices um, kind of um, compiled and organized in a way to address um, um, this um, um, project under under the executive order, um, and there's five overarching kind of security objectives that are listed here. Um, they align with with a number of these resources from um, you know making sure that that software is is protected um, from unauthorized access and usage, kind of protecting confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. Kind of identifying and maintaining platforms and software at risk, um, detecting, responding to, and recovering from threats and incidents, and as well as um, objective five, focused on kind of strengthening the human side um, within cybersecurity. So, focus more on, on another effort under the executive order. Um, this was focused on, um, on secure software development. Um, so NIST has um, had an effort underway for the past years on, on development of secure software development best practices called the SSDF, the Secure Software Development Framework, um, um, looking at kind of um, 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 you know, raising the bar kind of for federal wide software security um, with an eye towards kind of both software producers as well as software acquirers. Um, and this particular effort applies to all software, not just, not just critical software. Um, and the motivation is to, for, for this particular update of this SDF was to kind of help 
organizations um, plan for and kind of implement a, a risk-based approach to, to the development of software um, with the goal of kind of reducing software vulnerabilities. Um, and kind of few software development lifecycle models explicitly address software security. So the SSDF provides this kind of core set of high level um, secure software development principles that can be implemented throughout the, throughout the software development lifecycle. And by focusing on you know, all different levels of, of the life cycle, there's an emphasis on shifting left, increasing that focus on security earlier in the process um, of development. So what the SSSCF is, is it describes kind of um, these fundamental secure software development practices, as well as tasks to kind of secure development infrastructure. Um, and it describes these um, practices as, as outcomes. Um, it doesn't prescribe necessarily how to implement such outcomes. Um, and because of that flexibility, you know, the SSDF can be broadly applied um, across different technologies, across systems, um, and is used regardless of, of maturity of the organization. Um, and it's also um, designed to be adapted alongside of, kind of other NIST uh, cybersecurity resources. Um, as we all know, NIST has, has a number of publications. They're all designed to be used together. Um, and so that's our, our goal is to increase alignment there. Um, just like with critical software, um, OMB has also now um, pursuant to the executive order required federal agencies to implement the SSDF and kind of associated security guidance for NIST. Um, under the memo, there's certain deadlines, you know, that federal agencies have to meet um, to obtain kind of attestations from software pr producers and obtaining artifacts so that, um, so that agencies know that they're compliant with these um, secure software development practices. So I also lead the, um, the cybersecurity framework, which is also, you know, an outcome-based framework. And so if you're listening to kind of, you know, the attributes of the SSDF being described as risk-based, and outcome-based, it's very similar to the model of the cybersecurity framework. Um, the SSDF practices can actually um, help support um, a lot of the cybersecurity framework functions, categories, um, and subcategories, and essentially, um, if you know developers, the software adopt these best practices in the SSDF, the outcomes of their work will help um, um, with organizational cybersecurity as well. Um, instead of functions like in the cybersecurity framework, the function the SSDF relies on um, four different practice groups, um, and these practice groups are named um, on this slide. But encourage you to to kind of, if you haven't already, take a look at the SSDF in the full core. Um, it's, it's arranged by, you know, under each of these four practice groups, um, there are specific kind of tasks that are identified, you know, one or more actions that may be needed to perform a particular practice, as well as um, this included some kind of notional implementation examples, as well as references. Um, um, this is a kind of a new addition for us to kind of identify examples of the types of kind of tools or processes that, that could be implemented to help meet um, the outcome-based um, 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 uh, practices that are identified in the framework. Um, and there's also a number of references and kind of pointers to um, more established, secure um, guidance. Um, um, that's been developed by industry and, and other organizations. Um, and, and so you'll see that um, the framework is really meant to um, build off of the work um, that's already been done in this area. Um, now that we've um, just updated the SSDF earlier this year, we're now on version 1.1, we are considering kind of next steps for the evolution of, of the SSDF. Um, we recently launched a, um, a project at the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, the NCCOE, um, where we plan to work 
with vendors under a CRADA to, to kind of illustrate, um, you know, how the, the SSDF can be applied to kind of different software development lifecycle models, including um, DevSecOps, as well as um, a focus of um, looking at open source software security, which has been a, a growing concern in the past few years. Um, so we're, we're constantly um, um, finding ways to make um, the SSDF more, more tangible, show how vendors can implement it um, and implement it for, for, for different scenarios. Um, and so there's lots of work to do um, um, as we work to, um, to operationalize the SSDF. So John, I think I'll turn it back to you. Sure, thanks Sherry. <clears throat> I'd, I'd also throw out there as a note that that OMB memo uh, M2218 is somewhat of a stopgap measure and part of the executive order also uh, <clears throat> requested a FAR clause be developed. So that, that FAR clause is, uh, which which should be, I, I mean, I can't guess, but it, it it's gonna be in, uh, consistent with the intent of the memo. But that is really going to be where the, the rubber hits the road uh, <clears throat> permanently. Uh, again, the, the memo, uh, look at those timelines. One of those uh, timelines I would take note of also is the attestation document, which is in the process of being developed. So um, <clears throat> so part of the, the tasking of um, Section 4E of the executive order uh, was as Sherry said, to move left of center and kind of provide uh, guidance to software development. <clears throat> the other part of that tasking to NIST was to provide guidance to departments and agencies for accepting that that software and the <clears throat> and the attestation. So uh, we we talked a lot with the industry. We talked internally, and you know, it, it's a matter of trying to find that fidelity that's. <clears throat> that's not so low level that um, it's it's very onerous, but not so high level that it's uh, useless. So where where we ended up on is uh, really to ask for uh, kind of that that high level artifacts, <clears throat> excuse me, high level artifacts uh, to provide evidence that of the the fact that they are meeting that attestation. And it's a self-attestation. We we did not recommend uh, necessarily uh, third-party attestation as a base, as a foundational practice. Uh, many folks would say, well, you know, self-attestation doesn't really get you anything. Well, it does get you something uh, a little bit, right? <clears throat> what it gets you is uh, they are making a legally binding attestation uh, there's also a a law out there about lying to the government. Uh, so it, it does get you a little bit, but what this does is it allows kind of that, that crawl, walk, run approach and to get both uh, industry vendors and suppliers, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, ramped up for this. It also allows departments and agencies to, to prepare uh, internally. So we are asking for that initial... Uh, self-attestation with high-level artifacts. And we're, we're when we're talking high-level artifacts, those are really looking at um, how can I show that I am using these practices and standards uh, <clears throat> as, as, as evidence. We didn't want to go into that low-level artifacts because that really starts hitting into both the intellectual property. Uh, <clears throat> it also uh, starts looking at security features that uh, may be a big bonus for adversaries. So we, we wanted to stay away from that, that low, low level <clears throat> artifacts and evidence. What we did though in this document, when the, the guidance document, is say, if you do need more rigor because you know doing a real criticality analysis process, you are gonna identify certain types of software where you actually may need uh, a, a more rigorous conformity assessment than just self-attestation. And if that is the case, 
it points over to special publication 800 re revision one, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, in a second, but that's our, uh, our foundational uh, cybersecurity supply chain risk management document where we, can, we go into more detail on looking at that low level artifacts and evidence. And it's really, you know, if that is the case, I think uh, departments and agencies have to understand that there's going to be a greater cost <clears throat> and there's probably going to have to be different things in place, such as non-disclosure <clears throat> agreements and things of that like. <clears throat> so this little software verification, uh, many folks referred to it as software testing. Uh, uh, so this is a piece of the executive order that's kind of unlike uh, no other piece in the executive order in terms that it doesn't have dependencies. It doesn't really point to anything, but we wanted to get it in there to allow uh, <clears throat> for industry to kind of have one publication look at all the different types of software testing or verification. And for those that are familiar with software testing, there, there typically is not one test that you know, that can catch everything. It's It depends on uh, the type of software, the type of test, and quite often you have to use <clears throat> more than one test on a type of software to, to try to get to a, a fairly high uh, success rate and not get a lot of false negatives uh, or false positives. Um, let's see. So that I would note, uh, we delivered on time, which was a very quick churn in the executive order. And what the uh, the developers did is they actually turned that guidance and they they uh, made it a little bit more robust and turned it into a NIST publication. It's NIST Interagency Report 8397, if you want to go search that up. But uh, this is really useful information. Uh, so that, that was somewhat of a standalone, uh, pardon me. <clears throat> so another part of the, the executive order just said, provide additional supply chain risk management guidance. Uh, so that's what we did. We, we, it just so happened that we were updating SB 800-161. It was about a two and a half year process. Caught us right in the middle. It couldn't have been better timing because uh, this allowed us to develop some of the supply chain specific guidance and put it out for public comment, which we did in our second draft of that publication. Excuse me. Um, so the approach that we took is, again, the, the timing kind of worked out to us. Uh, we were, we were, you know, building that plane a little bit while I was flying with the other parts of the executive order. But ultimately what we did is we, we ended up taking some of the other parts of the executive order, specifically uh, the critical software and the security measures piece, uh, software verification, and then the SSDF and the attestation, and tried to add a little bit more value to it in regard to the special publication. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, for example, with software verification, we went through all of the different security controls and pulled out the ones where software testing could be utilized. Uh, for the executive, uh, for the security measures, what we did is we looked through all of the security control or the controls in the security measures and looked at which ones we actually thought should be flowing down to the tier one uh, supplier. And we did this because actually, even though those security measures are pointing towards uh, EO critical software, there's such foundational security measures that we actually think that they should be used for any type of software, not just EO critical software. So we pulled out the ones that we thought should be flow down controls and contracts. Oh. And also with the SSDF, we, we provided some additional guidance over on the right hand side in some of those emerging concepts. And I'll skip over to there. Uh, I just kind of went through that, so I'll move on to this next one. So <clears throat> we we uh, had a few additional items where you know the other ones were kind of uh, the the standards and practices that are already out there. 
these were some of the evolving standards tools and practices that we wanted to highlight and um, focus on in a little a little bit more uh, depth and breadth. And uh, I'll say some of the uh, for for SBOM, for example. So that being in the executive order was a little bit aspirational because uh, the it's it's still somewhat of a, a nascent. Uh, community out there, <clears throat> not so far as the developer side. I mean, uh, Bill of Materials have been around for 30 plus years on the developer side, but they're protected by non non-disclosure agreements. It's more on the consumption side and the end user side where it's fairly nascent. So there's still work that's ongoing out there that um, DHS is leading that that is progressing and moving it forward. But we at least wanted to address uh, and go into a little bit detail and provide departments and agencies at least some initial guidance. And the way we did it with all of these uh, that we've listed here, the four, <clears throat> are to go through what we've done elsewhere in 161, which is to really look at foundational practices, sustaining practices, and enhancing practices. And this gives the user kind of a crawl, walk, run approach to developing uh, internally, some of the capabilities to address this. Excuse me. So, in terms of like the SSDF and attestations, and how I was mentioning before that although it's initially a self attestation kind of um, low level conformity assessment, and it points to 161, here we go into greater uh, detail on enhanced vendor risk assessments and how to go about doing those, those risk assessments that may need uh, more, more rigor with critical uh, software, organizational critical software. Uh, <clears throat> uh, open source software was also highlighted, and this provides a lot of guidance on software security and software protection. Uh, very little specifically on open source software, and this is not free open source software. It's open source software that is procured or purchased by the US government. So we provided additional um, guidance there. And then vulnerability management. Software bill of materials is great, but it's not a silver bullet. It can't stand alone on its own. It needs a entire vulnerability management program within an organization to, to have bookends on different aspects of that, and that's inventory and everything else. So we, we again, we, we provide foundational sustaining and enhancing practices for those, <coughs> excuse me. So this is kind of our, uh, uh, we're getting close towards the end. Uh, this is a big, you know, th this presentation uh, largely stems from a, a presentation we gave at RSA last year, and that this is a, a big RSA ask that we provide, uh, you know, steps that folks can take. Um, really, what I have to say is it, it's, it's like risk management. The, the first step every organization should take is just be informed, right? No. Know both what your uh, what the requirements are from a governance perspective. Know what uh, the 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 supply chain partners are asking for. What you need to ask from your supply chain partners. Uh, what you know what the requirements are going to be, and then look internally on what your capabilities are. Uh, Sherry mentioned you know the SSDF and how it's laid out as a framework. At that that is why we like frameworks so much is because it allows organizations of every different maturity to kind of plug and play in there, right? So if it's a less mature organization, we provide different standards and practices for that organization to look at and start implementing. If it's a very secure organization, or I mean a very mature organization, and it even if it's using some of its uh, secret sauce, Right. If it's, you know, you can still plug that into the different uh, practices and tasks within that framework. Um, and again, it's it's so incredible. And keep keep a lookout. Sherry mentioned that we, we kicked off an NCCOE project on the SSDF. 
that will be looking at implementation of not just proprietary software, but also open source software. Uh, we had a kickoff workshop uh, not too long ago, and we just recently, I believe last week, uh, put out the final project uh, description. And then we will soon be going out with the Federal Register notice. Uh, so keep, a, keep an eye on uh, that. Uh, Sherry, did you have anything you wanted to add on this slide? <coughs> Excuse me. So what's next? Uh, Sherry, you want a top bullet or? Yeah, I can cover the update to the cybersecurity framework. So um, as you may know, we've um, uh, not directed under the executive order, so we can take our time um, <laughs> with the update to the cybersecurity framework, but we are planning a, a major update to the cybersecurity framework um, moving towards CSF 2.0, and, and um, it, it, it's a good opportunity to take a look at, you know, all of this new um, updated guidance relating to supply chain um, and software security to see, you know, um, whether some of those topics need to be considered or, or mapped into um, the cybersecurity framework. So um, we, we had a request for information from for stakeholders in the spring of this year. Um, we heard a lot um, from stakeholders that yes, we would love greater alignment with things like the SSDS um, and greater consideration of um, supply chain cybersecurity in the framework. Um, now the hard work begins of actually determining what exact changes you know, stakeholders would like to see um, um, within this particular area. So um, we've had one workshop already um, yeah, uh, that attracted you know, about 4,000 attendees across 100 countries. Um, so really high level of interest um, in this framework update and, and, and software security is definitely going to be um, one of the focuses as we move forward with that update. Right, thanks. Like so I'll, I'll, I'll just touch on uh, two other areas. I think we kind of talked about the uh, the NCCOE and the, the uh, OSS work there. Uh, for the National Initiative for Improving Cybersecurity and Supply Chains, uh, this is something we're, we're still engaging folks on. Uh, we've done a lot of work on supply chain over the last 12 plus years. Uh, there is now, since there's such a great attention on cybersecurity supply chain risks, and trying to address those, there's a lot of fodder out there. And so what we're trying to do is kind of make sense and where NIST within its swim lane and expertise can play a role that will, will help um, both industry as well as the acquirers. Traditionally, we have provided guidance directly to acquiring organizations. We're hoping to build off the SSDF and kind of move left of center and start trying to work in up, upstream in the supply chain and provide <clears throat> guidance in, and and it's really about building trust mechanisms right in the supply chain so that acquirers can have a greater amount of assurance and that's not just end user acquirers that's that's acquirers that are building technology throughout the supply chain. Uh, so we'll we'll continue our work on there. Look forward to engaging on that, and and part of that. And as a segue into the the cybersecurity privacy reference tool, is there's so much information out there, right? There's a lot of information overload, and it NIST has a lot, right? We have all these publications, we have all these multiple frameworks. When somebody comes to our site and our portal, they get lost, and there's so many overlapping overlapping connections between the different frameworks, between the different guidance. What we're trying to do is create this tool that is friendlier to the uh, user, right? So that they can uh, make little mappings and use multiple tools uh, and really have it focus more on the con uh, customer experience in terms of finding the right information and consuming the right information and making the connections between the, the different guidance documents, publications, and frameworks. Uh, so that's the CPRT.
<clears throat> and and that is a work in uh, pro, pro, uh, a work in process. Uh, I was probably the way I described it, it, probably a little bit more aspirational where it is now, but that's kind of the end goal that I described. Sherry, woohoo! 50th anniversary. So this is yeah, this is our obligatory 50th anniversary <laughs> slide. But I think it highlights that. You know, it, it's pretty fascinating that NIST has been in the cybersecurity space for the past 50 years. Um, and um, as John mentioned, over the past 50 years, we've certainly developed um, our fair share of, of cybersecurity guidance and, and tools and resources. You know, we started with um, our work on, you know, cryptography, um, but today, you know, our work covers so much more, including, you know, the, the discussion of cybersecurity risk management and software security that we discussed today. Um, I think one of the things that that John and I didn't talk about, which 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 we usually do when we get presentations, which is our commitment to working with stakeholders when we, um, you know, develop our, our publications. Um, we have a really um, kind of collaborative, um, transparent, open process that NIST uses to develop um, our resources. And, and we believe that when we work with the community, um, you know, with a blank sheet of paper, that that, that will result in kind of um, better resources, you know, more effective, usable resources that are, um, that, that are more widely to be used as well as trusted. Um, and that's certainly the case with all of the, the various publications that we presented on today. You know, we, we had maybe um, seven or eight different workshops dedicated to EO publications working with thousands of different participants, um, you know, public comment periods on drafts, and we asked for position papers. Um, and I think that um, the, the, um, the community that's built around you know, the development of our resources is almost just as important as, as the PDF resources themselves. And so um, really invite you all to kind of participate um, in, in our journey as we um, um, move forward with, with more um, um, different projects in different areas and, and appreciate your time today. Should we um, take questions? Thank you for that presentation. Uh, that was great. <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, thanks for the, the compliments on the webinar intro video. That is something uh, brand new that our graphics people put together. Uh, they'll be very happy to uh, hear those compliments. Um, John, thanks for soldiering through, uh, through today. Uh, we did have some technical difficulties at the very beginning, but uh, thankfully, uh, NIST believes in defense in depth, and we had two presenters, so we were able to rebound from that uh, rather quickly. Um, while I wait for the audience to um, submit some of their questions, can you, one thing I, I do want to note uh, for um, our membership, um, our most viewed page on the CSI website is actually our DOD cybersecurity policy chart. Um, we have about 200 uh, policies on there. Obviously, we can't put everything up, up on there, but a lot of the 800 series policies that were referenced in, two, in today's presentation is up there. Um, it's a color-coded chart. Most of the NIST policies are in that bluish, greenish color, that aqua color, so you can find those there. Uh, feel free to check our website. Um, we also monitor NIST as well. I think they do a great job, um, as you have said, of uh, being collaborative. So whenever you guys put out a new publication or request for comment, that's something that we try to highlight and put in our newsletters and our digest to make sure that our membership is aware um, of what's going on. Um, in regards to the presentation, um, can you guys speak to IoT, Internet of Things, and um, its relation to software supply chain security? <laughs> so, um, so we've at NIST we've kind of treated uh, our work on IoT, cybersecurity under the executive order, separate from our work on on secure software. Um, there's obviously a lot of interest um, now in um, our work on labeling, um, mm -hmm. which is still ongoing. Um, um, so we've been having conversations with 
with the White House about, you know, how we can take the um, kind of the, the fundamental research that, that we did on, on an IoT label um, and, and um, clearly there's some interest in, in taking that further um, to some, some sort of actual label um, that would be developed and, and, and um, approved. Um, so lots of conversations ongoing about that. Um, so um, we'll see where, where that heads. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned that, that obviously you're doing a lot of work on the cybersecurity framework on the CSF. Um, I think, you know, the website you guys have is great up there. I believe you, you even had a section at one point called success stories where um, you showed how different organizations and different types of organizations could implement other than CSF. Um, sometimes we do get questions, people reach out about the policy chart for different updates, but then you know, we do get follow up questions of how to actually implement that. So anything you guys can do, um, which kind of shows the examples and reference implementations, I think is, is great. I know you touched on it. Do you guys have a rough idea of when uh, 2.0 will be coming out? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a question I always get um, on timeline and and the Political answer is, is that it will depend on, you know, stakeholder feedback and the kind of extent of changes that stakeholders want to see, you know, for changing um, functions within the CSF is obviously something that's going to require um, a larger conversation, um, given the kind of significant adoption around the world that we've seen around the five functions. Um, but we're looking at least, you know, a year, a year and a half before um, we see final publication of 2.0. Um, throughout that process, we'll, we will release, you know, a draft for comment. We'll continue to have workshops. Um, so no one will be surprised um, about the, the changes that, that um, might be made um, to the framework in version 2.0. Um, and, and for your point about, you know, success stories and resources, um, that's something that, that we're always looking to do, and and um, we're also interested in in the resources that the community develops. So, you know, if you look at the cybersecurity framework, you know, NIST has developed some implementation guidance, um, some profiles um, for specific sectors or specific threats. Like we have a cybersecurity framework profile for ransomware. Some of these resources have also been developed, you know, by other federal agencies. Um, by trade associations, by other groups. And so we like to see um, that, you know, a lot of this work being done um, outside of this um, is really important to us. Um, and, and I think the, the work that's going on at, you know, the NCCOE, the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence to, to take a look at the SSCS, I think will also be um, um, really great because the, the NCCOE is able to delve more deeply into kind of specific scenarios, specific sectors, um, working with vendors under CRADA, and then they develop practice guides that are really detailed um, for those that really want, you know, um, more specific guidance about a particular issue. So that's, that's another area that we always like to highlight is, is you know, don't, um, um, we have a lot of resources. Um, some of them are kind of spread out um, and so we're, we're trying to find ways to, to aggregate those and make it easier for folks to find. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, one of the other things you mentioned during the presentation was a workshop that you held as well. Um, just a shameless plug, definitely let CSI know about that. In addition to the cybersecurity policy chart and trying to stay updated on policies, one thing that we, we try to promote via our website is events as well. So I think that's something that our membership would definitely like to take advantage of. Um, but with that said, I'm monitoring the attendee chat as well. I'm not seeing any questions, uh, any further questions as of right now. So I'd definitely like to thank you, both of you for your time. Uh, our next webinar will be next month, uh, focused on simulation-based testing for DoD software. We'll be talking about AppSim and OneSaf and things like that. So I encourage everybody to, uh, to join for that one as well. Um, but with that said, I'll end today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You so much. Have a good day. Oh.